Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani, I'm the Total Connector, and I'm really excited, really, really excited to have Obi Wan um, on my show for the first time. If you don't know him by now and you're not following, you should. Um, his his content uh, he uh, that he publishes is just amazing. Uh, his latest article is called Hyper Bitcoinization: When It Takes All. Where he lays down, you know, lays out the the process of uh, the path to hyper Bitcoinization, a very really uh, comprehensive and and succinct and and really clear language. And uh, follow him on Twitter for sure. It's uh, Obi Wan Kenobit is his Twitter handle. So if you have any questions, let me know. I will uh, hopefully also I want to have him also back uh, if he has the time and uh, to. To you know, join us in a panel discussion with other Bitcoiners and or economists, and yeah, uh, we are on the path uh, to hyper Bitcoinization. It's just a matter of time and uh, patience, which is uh, unfortunately one of my weaknesses. But we're getting there. I think unexpected circumstances and dynamic factors playing out will eventually. Uh, uh, accelerate this process which is already is you know i mean people are waking up opening up they're they're understanding more and more something is wrong with this whole you know super centralized uh surreal uh system with uh, nation states governments and central banks and the fiat uh uh you know infinite trillion brr, money anyway um without further ado this is my talk with obi-wan and hope you're gonna love it Welcome, Obi-Wan, to my Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, listen, Obi-Wan, I mean, I've been following you for, for, I don't know, for quite some time and your, uh, the, the, the depth and the breadth of, of your content, of the substance is really impressive. And um, I've been actually surprised that I haven't seen you or not that I've heard of that you've been on any other podcast shows. Have you, is that your first uh, like public um, interview or something? I, I was on um, Citizen Bitcoin about, I think about two or three oh. months ago. Okay, I must have missed that. Okay, got to listen to that one too. Um, so, Obi Wan, uh, you um, you wrote a, a really f a fantastic article um, on Medium dot com. Um, if um, some of the articles have been already um, censored, <laughs> so I don't know what's going on with Medium, or uh, I don't know. So the censorship is pretty in high gear right now. Um, anyway. Um, so that's the article I'm talking about um, for my listeners, hyper Bitcoinization, when it takes all. Um, why did you, um, I would ask you, can you take us a little bit through this process of your thought process and uh, the assumptions you're making and your estimates? Like what is the process of going into hyper Bitcoinization for like for as a general picture? So. Sure. Thanks. Just a little bit of background, I started thinking about hyper-Bitcoinization as I was learning about Bitcoin. I came across uh, Daniel Kraswitz's article and was very fascinated by the whole concept that there is money that is out of the hand of the state and could conceivably replace um, the global reserve currency, the U.S. dollar, in a, in a matter of decades. And during the the last run up in 2017, I think there was a lot of discussion on Twitter, a lot of discussion in um, Telegram and Discord groups that this was it, that we're going to be making the first move towards hyper Bitcoinization. And my understanding of sort of global macro trends and also uh, currency, I didn't feel that that was going to happen right away. I mean, I, I think one to two years in 2017 was extremely optimistic and probably a fantasy. And realistically, we're talking about a multi-decade process. So I decided to think a lot, think deeply about you know, what happens when currencies are displaced, what has happened in the past, and what is the process that we can see you know, Bitcoin taking, the path that Bitcoin's gonna take going forward. And so I, I went, went back and I, I watched some of Andreas's videos. He's very informative in regards to uh, this particular 
uh, process. He's actually, I would say, somewhat against the concept of hyper-Bitcoinization. And so I thought that was a nice uh, counter to, to be able to look at his discussion and see what are the counterpoints to that. Um, then I also looked at some of the earlier um, currencies. If you go back and look at Roman currency and see how they debased their currency over a 150 year period, um, and then eventually the state collapsed. So I see similar type of process occurring and in a shorter period of time, in part because we're now in a much more interconnected uh, world, things seem to be happening much faster. And as I mentioned in the article, uh, you know, Bitcoin is a network money for a network economy. Everything is happening at orders of magnitude faster. Um, the, the change uh, curve, as you can see in these two graphs you've pulled up here, uh, the adoption curves of technology are near vertical uh, beginning in about 2010 or so. Um, you can see the, the iPhone, the tablet, podcasting, uh, smartphone usage, social media usage. They're literally, the rate of growth itself is accelerating. And so I see this process occurring as well with Bitcoin. I think right now we're still in the very early stages, but there will come a time when Bitcoin itself will accelerate very similarly to this and not necessarily in price, but I'm thinking in terms of adoption, in terms of uh, usage as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at this, um, um, these beautiful uh, graphs that you put on your, your article, um, the sort of the adoption curves, um, do you think that we are um, in a time, I mean, we've got the year 2020, and do you, do you see this accelerating, the, uh, sort of the, the adoption curve, like uh, not only for Bitcoin, but for every other technology that is emerging? Oh, definitely. I, I think for, for Bitcoin, even if you look back and say mid-2012 mid, mid, mid 2012 to, to 2016, prior to the, uh, the previous run-up, in price, the discussion was really limited to small circles, really technical circles, um, some folks in the Austrian economics circles, uh, and really wasn't until after 2017 that it really became what I like to call socially wired. It's now, it's pervasive. Even though people don't talk about it, I would say most people have heard, about, hear, mm -hmm. heard of Bitcoin, which was not the case four or five years ago. So I think that is sort of the seed, if you will. And now with the current economic crisis, uh, the discussion and the mentions of Bitcoin, um, you know, the idea that the U.S. dollar is not going to be the reserve currency uh, for the next generation or two, that it actually is being threatened. And people are now talking about Bitcoin again. And, um, and they're no longer laughing at it. It's actually becoming a serious consideration and serious conversations about money, about some of the concepts that Bitcoin is raising. Um, you know, what is money? What is hard money? What is fiat? And I think these types of conversations are now occurring that did not occur two years ago. So I think from that perspective, uh, Bitcoin has already started making its move along its adoption curve, at least in the, in the mind share, in the mind share space. Now you look at these other technologies like iPhones and, or smartphones and tablets and whatnot, the adoption of those technologies is absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, the, it's, it's not even a doubling rate. It's this logarithmic mm -hmm. curve um, where every year you're seeing not a double, but four times and eight times and so forth and so on. I th think um, there's a, a book I recently read. It's called The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth. Yeah, it's a short, I, short I just started reading it. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, book, yeah. It's an amazing book, short book, very easy to read, very well thought out. And in it, he gives this example of folding a piece of paper. And if you fold a piece of paper 50 times, you know, how far does it go? And it's amazing that it actually will reach the sun, um, just folding a piece of paper. And I think that's where we are in technology. We folded the piece of paper a few times. And now every time you fold that piece of paper, the technology itself is going to make leaps and bounds uh, beyond what we can imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is observable. I just just uh, talked in my last discussion and panel discussion on my show um, um, uh, with a bunch of Bitcoiners, uh, and I said that you know, I mean, we are all witnessing. Uh, let's say in the Bitcoin space, people are coming to me or other people and asking, you know, 
what's up? Isn't it too late? You know, should I buy whatever this and that shit coin? <laughs> so, uh, but people are, are becoming aware of that. And I think they're feeling something, at least intuitively, maybe they don't understand the whole process, what's going on with this whole, uh, you know, symptom of, um, of um, all the symptoms that, you know, that are arising, uh, you know, this whole Corona uh, pandemic, whatever it's called, and, and the chain reaction it has caused. So, do you see like exogenous factors playing in? Because there's an article I'm trying to still comprehend the, the you know the bigger picture here. It's called uh, from on Zero Hedge down the rabbit hole. The euro dollar market is the matrix behind it all, um, and there's this tif Tiffany uh, paradigm sh shift. Uh, sort of in plain English, that would mean uh, pro uh, the way I understand it is that uh, because the uh, the dollar is the dominant the dominant uh, international reserve currency. And it could uh, eventually, you know, be, because of whatever inflation, hyperinflation and running out of dollars um, re, uh, be replaced by some other um, uh, currency. Uh, can you make a, like a rhyme out of this? I mean, can you tie this in into, into the hyper-Bitcoinization scenario? Uh, do, do you have yeah, like... Definitely we can. Um, so in, in my original article, which I wrote nearly two years ago, one of the things that I look back at that article and I wish I had added a little bit more discussion are these exogenous type of effects. I think I just sort of obliquely refer to them um, as financial crises. Um, but you really look at how Bitcoin is going to develop. It's going to require these types of events to occur. Uh, it, fiat will not collapse simply because of Bitcoin, but fiat will, fiat will collapse in on of itself. And if you go back and look at all of the currency crises, economic crises since the 1970s, really since we left the gold standard, they've been accelerating. We have more and more currency crises. We have more inflation, more debt. Um, in, and you look at the current debt in the US, it's essentially at the world height of the World War II, yet whose war and what war are we fighting? And I, I look back at this and I think it's really the war on citizens across the globe. And as part of becoming, as part of being the U.S. reserve, uh, the global reserve currency, the U.S., as in that article mentions, has external effects which can rebound against it. Mm -hmm. uh, despite, local, despite its national policies, uh, it unfortunately has, or it's the nature of being the reserve currency, it's going to have these exogenous effects, which are going to essentially create immense pressure on the um, on the validity of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. And I think um, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the Roman denarius coin had a very similar impact. The Roman Empire was vast; you had a huge outflow of denarius coins um, and, um, uh, and and trade deficits, whatnot and uh, capital deficits as well and eventually the state itself collapsed because its 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 coins were debased from 100 percent silver to 0.5 percent silver over a 150 year period um, obviously that was a much longer period than we are in now and they were using commodity based money but nevertheless the fact that it was essentially the reserve currency at its time for its local environment um, led to its collapse mm -hmm. Fascinating. Um, what I like about your, your threads, it's always very succinct and compact. Um, um, let me see, let me pull this up. Um, uh, where was it? I, I, was, I had it. Okay, I lost it. Anyway, um, I was on your Twitter page and uh, you made sort of a list of, of all the things, you know, that's, that's going on, whatever, with the FDIC, with with over leveraging, with the inflation, hyperinflation. So I really uh, loved the sort of the overview. And, oh, there it is. Like, uh, you know, provide basic income, private debt cancellation, uh, create money instantly, lend funds at zero cost, state guarantees on loans, ignore corporate credit risk, not cyclical. So I, I really love the, your Twitter threads because it gives like an overview what is really fundamental structurally uh, changing right now and what kind of, of uh, you know, of unimaginable impact effects this can have on, you know, on this uh, centralized fiat money system. Um, do you want to like go a little bit deeper, like 
could you give like my listeners like a bigger overview, bigger picture? Uh, what so they they can so we can all you know um, connect the dots a little bit better. Sure, um, I think we can go back uh, even into the start with a little bit in the eighteen hundreds and understand that gold, the gold standard during the Belle Epoque in the eighteen hundreds. Um, was essentially a time of technological innovation. It was a time mm. of great industry, prosperity. Um, prices were stable. Uh, over a period of 10 years, a loaf of bread was exactly the same price. There were a few instances when countries went to war, they printed their own money to fund their wartime activities, but then returned to the gold standard. And then in the 1900s, we saw the development, actually late 1800s in the U.S., we saw the development of an early sort of Federal Reserve, it was called the Second National Bank of the US. Um, and then that led to ultimately the Federal Reserve. And as we know, and as probably many of your listeners know, uh, gold over a period of about 70 years was slowly co-opted um, and completely co-opted by, um, by FDR in the 1940s. And then we left the gold standard in 1971. So, so what does that mean when we leave the gold standard? One is that money is no longer, um, the money is out, has become completely within the hand of the state. There's no independent miner digging for gold and bringing that back to the state, selling it to the state, or the state itself going out and seeking its own gold through, through swaps or through purchases. But instead, banks can instantaneously print money with a few keyboard strokes. And I think what this list here shows uh, the provide basic income UBI is that when when the state can print as much money as it wants when it has complete control over essentially the economy it is both the supply actor and the demand actor and from zero it can create money and charge interest that has downstream effects and part of those downstream effects are essentially uh, inflation which it's reportedly 2%, but I think if we go back and look historically over a period of 20, 30 years, we can see that that inflation is much, much higher, particularly in areas like health care, yeah. housing, and education. So what's the effective, like, is it around like 10 or even 12 or something like that in that range? It's, it's unfortunate because it's, it could be much higher. It depends on what income strata you're from. It depends on what country you live in, um, you know, what state you live in in the United States. You may see, you know, food costs that are substantially higher uh, than than other other places, simply based on uh, simply based uh, on infl local inflation. But basically, uh, if you go back and look at what's happening in the major sectors like healthcare, education, housing, and food, um, inflation there is probably running in the double digits. It's it's not 50, 60 percent, but it's probably more along the lines of 10 to 15 percent. Um, and and I think you have to. And that's not the only factor. What we also have to look at is wage wages as well. Over the last 10, 15 years, there's been significant wage stagnation. And so that coupled to, you know, rising prices um, and assets uh, being at all time highs where people are priced out of homes, they're unable to afford rent. Um, they're unable to even save any money to participate in capital markets. Sort of the effective inflation is much, much higher. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, do you see the, uh, because right now there's a, uh, I see a, a Twitter uh, post, uh, a tweet from you, from Mario, Mario Draghi, former president of the European Central Bank. Um, do you see the euro, um, because there's a insolvency, the banks in Germany are already insolvent. That's a lot of experts saying that. So it's just a matter of time. It's um, probably even in, this year, maybe next year. So do you see the euro crashing um, from your perspective? Well, I, I think that if you, in, the, in that article that you pointed out earlier from Zero Hedge, I think that's, that's a great article that really helps describe and understand what's going on between various different currencies. Mm -hmm. And it really boils down to, to, to one thing, is that the US dollar essentially runs the world. 90% of all trade, um, is done through the US dollar. And so everything boils down to that. What happens with the Euro dollar? Um, how much uh, reserves do foreign countries and foreign banks um, have uh, uh, 
have a, in a euro, in euro dollar denomination. And in reading the article, you'll see that it's not much. You know, you're talking about a 57, I think they said 57 trillion, 60 trillion in the article mm -hmm. is how large that market is. But they don't have a Federal Reserve to print money when they need it. They've got to come back to the U.S. and ask for these currency swap, for these, uh, uh, these swap lines, which the Federal Reserve announced about a week or so ago. And I actually mentioned that in my, I'm going to uh, post a long thread either later on today or tomorrow. And I, and I mentioned uh, something along those lines and sort of describe what, what that means. But essentially what's happening, and this, is, this applies to the Euro, to the Australian dollar, Canadian dollar as well, is that you have a flight to the US dollar, but there's not enough US dollars um, in the system outside of the US. And so that's why you're seeing strength in the US dollar right now, uh, which is also um, problematic for the US for a variety of reasons. But the, the biggest issue here with all of the Euro, with the Euro as well, is that U.S. outflow of dollars into the euro dollar, uh, into the matrix, so to speak, as Zero Hedge says here, um, is going to be substantially mitigated over the next 12 to 18 months just because the demand in the U.S. has gone down. Um, people will not be buying as much, not spending as much. Consumerism is Consumer activity is going to slow down. And so what that means is it's basically they're going to be short the dollar um, outside of the United States. And that's why the Federal Reserve opened up these swap lines to help, to help secure them and extend them loans. However, if you look at the numbers the Federal Reserve has offered, they're substantially lower than what's really needed. So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see foreign currencies under pressure, but you're mm -hmm. also going to see the Federal Reserve potentially extending its hand to a much larger number of banks and much larger amounts of money perhaps you know, beyond, beyond a few billion dollars into the trillions. So I, I suspect over the next six to 12 months, we'll probably see the, the Federal Reserve expand its activity um, and support the Euro dollar market. That's, wow, that's mind boggling. Um, so what, what would you say, I mean, what, what does it mean for Bitcoin? Do you think that there is um, unexpected um, critical i will you know i always call it like critical adoption rate um because of all these um you know factors playing out um, more and more not it's not necessarily like institutional uh, you know or government or what but like really the average like more average people um coming into bitcoin because they understand more they feel more the pain um uh, would it be inflation or you know economical uh, suffering pain I, I think so. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as we said there, I think the mind share um, has gone up over the last few years. And now with the Federal Reserve essentially printing trillions of dollars in a matter of weeks, what took years for the previous crisis, um, has, has shocked a lot of people. Um, there are folks in my circle who are not particularly sophisticated with, with money, yet understand that there's something not right with the system. When the Federal Reserve can print trillions upon trillions of dollars and promise more, or as Neil uh, Kashkari said, you know, we have an infinite amount of cash. Um, you know, if the Federal Reserve can state that, people are asking, you know, then why don't we have, you know, uh, uh, why don't we have solar panels in every house? Why don't we have universal health care? Why do we go to work? Why are we paying taxes if, if the amount of money in the system is essentially infinite? And, and I think that then, then you start looking at alternatives and, mm -hmm. and people are starting to ask about Bitcoin and wonder, you know, what is Bitcoin? What does it offer? Um, how is it something that can preserve, you know, my personal wealth um, as opposed to my currency being debased, you know, within a matter of weeks? Mm -hmm. um, I've got this graph on your article, your article, Hyper Bitcoinization Growth Model, where you also talk about uh, previously uh, the paragraph is about uh, crystallization. Do you want to? Talk about a comment a little bit, but what is crystallization? What do you mean with crystallization? Sure. Um, so crystals, when you when you put a uh, um, uh, when you're when you want to develop a crystal or build a crystal, um, you start with sort of this um, nidus of this small um, uh, a crystal seed, if you will, mm -hmm. and then over time, as you add more crystals to the solution, they eventually start binding together and forming a lattice. 
And like anything in, in nature, um, you know, the more connections you make between the different various different bits of the crystal and the lattice, the stronger it becomes as a whole, as opposed to the individual units. And so what I describe here is what typically happens in a crystallization process. Very early on, there's this sort of nucleation. And um, in the nucleation process, that's where you just have basic activity, uh, these first connections being made, um, setting up the lattice, if you will, uh, for the rest of the crystallization process. And that happens very early on. You actually don't notice it right away. And then as time goes on, as the bonds between the different areas uh, um, in, the, in this economic system start connecting to each other, they become stronger and stronger to the point where, um, as you see going up the curve, it becomes almost impossible to break it. Mm -hmm. And so here I described um, uh, in, this, in, this, in this graph, sort of described where we are, uh, which is probably just coming right out of the peak of nucleation, uh, still, still quite away from, um, from the tipping point. But I think a lot of the key, key, key ingredients are already there for, for hyper-Bitcoinization and for Bitcoin to be hugely successful. And not necessarily in price, but I think also as, as a new form of money um, that could supplant the U.S. dollar or any other type of fiat monies. Um, so I think we're... we're Along the curve, it seems flat right now. It doesn't seem like much is happening, but within a matter of decade, two decades, we'll see things shift very quickly. Mm -hmm. Do you see the because you you have in that um, under nucleation, you you know you write um, you, uh, it says engineers exchanges wallets, nodes, security, etc. Do you in your from your perspective, in your opinion, do you think? Um, it's it is already user friendly enough. Like if there were demand, or do you think there is there's still a you know we have we still have you know there's much potential out there. But um, it once the demand kicks in, would the technological gap sort of fill itself? Like you know like would it would it accelerate? Like becoming more user friendly, would it be hard wallets? Um, pr coin joining, uh, privacy, security, you know, all these things that maybe the average person is not really familiar with yet? Yeah, I think that we're still early. Um, I, I think that the user experience is still limited. The exchanges have improved a bit compared to, actually improved a lot compared to three or four years ago. When I first tried to uh, purchase my first Bitcoin, um, it was a very harrowing experience. I had no idea. <laughs> where my money was going, who I was sending it to, um, and, um, uh, uh, and then but, the, the, the but user. You're not, you're not one of the Mount Gox uh, users. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'm post Mount Gox, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew about Bitcoin during Mount Gox, and actually I, I knew more about it during the, uh, the Silk Road days. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody actually explained it to me very thoroughly during the Silk Road days, and I completely ignored it. But... Um, Regardless, I, I, th I still think we're very early. Um, you know, most people feel uncomfortable when they interact with an exchange. Um, you know, despite uh, our, 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 our dislike of Coinbase, I think Coinbase has done a, bet a better job than, uh, than most in terms of the user interface. Um, I, you know, I don't agree with all of their choices and the way they place Bitcoin above Bitcoin, or Bitcoin Cash above Bitcoin and whatnot about a year ago. But um, I think we still have a lot, a lot of ways to go. It re really should feel like you open an app, you click buy, a lot like what Cash App is. You, right. you click buy, you get your Bitcoin, you transfer it maybe to another app inside your phone, and then you can use it as money um, or store it uh, securely. So I, I think for a lot of people that that's the hard part. It's, it's still hard. And then, and then getting to the concept that if I lose my key, I lose my Bitcoins. Right. That is an extremely hard, um, uh, uh, that's a very big barrier for most people. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that speaks, to, that speaks to fiat monies, that our money is soft. You know, our money is not you know, particularly important um, uh, in, in the sense that you know, we can you know, call the credit card company and cancel our transaction or get a refund and whatnot. Um, or the, the FDIC so supposedly is you know, backing up our, our money. So I think that you know, we have a very soft, loose relationship with money, and Bitcoin is going to force us to have a much more active 
relationship. And I think that that's, that's a barrier that still has yet to be crossed yet. With it, uh, the mindset too, right? Because it's really about self-sovereignty, taking self-responsibility. I think it's a paradigm shift in the mindset. It is a little bit of challenge, I think, for a lot of people. Like taking self, full self-custody, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think that it's, it's not a foreign concept. I mean, before, before the fiat, you know, we had gold and mm -hmm. people had to store their gold coins and secure them. And once you lost your gold, you lost your gold. That was it. Um, so I, I think that the, the, the concept of securing your own, your own wealth is, is not a foreign concept, but it is old concept. And it's something that, that we'll have to learn more about and teach. And, and that's part of being part of being on Twitter and, and writing articles on medium is to teach people. Um, but, but it, it, it will, it will take some time. Yeah. Indeed. Um, well, I do think there, uh, somehow I have this feeling, intuition at least, you know, we cannot make estimates and, you know, your article is also based on estimates, of course, we all we can all make just estimates, but there's, there's this feeling that it could happen much sooner, much more unexpectedly that we could even imagine or comprehend. Uh, but, you know, it depends again on a variety of dynamic factors uh, playing out. So, um, as you eloquently also, uh, you know, that's what I like about your article is that, uh, you know, what the future holds once, you know, we kick in into this, whatever critical adoption, hyper Bitcoinization, um, you know, that everything else would then prosper. Um, um, you, you, you formulate a little bit differently, so education, agriculture, medicine, industry, you know, I, I would also just explicitly just say to that, uh, you, you probably most probably know, you know, Safid and Amu's book, uh, uh, the, the Bitcoin standard, where he talks, you know, the differentiation between gold standard and then uh, whatever 19th century uh, and, and, and then uh, soft money and how, how technological innovation evolved uh, from, you know, z uh, to, to you know, quote Peter Thiel, from zero to one, from one to many. Um, do you do you think people ca do understand what it means to be on a hard or hardest money, such as Bitcoin, and what it means for for us as society, as as a civilization, on every level we can think of, like scientifically, technologically, maybe even spiritually, you know, or uh, from the you know process of um, evolutionary acceleration. I, I think right now most people don't understand. Um, mm. You know, most people are, are unfortunately still uh, the wool has been pulled over their eyes, and um, you know they still believe in the fiat system, and, and they really don't know anything different. Um, you know, it's been many, many generations since we've had hard money, uh, really, probably you know over a hundred years. Um, so I think that that's again, you know, one of these sort of barriers in thinking that many will have to cross over. But this current crisis is, it's, it, I think, has cracked the facade in fiat. Um, the current crisis is showing people that you know money can be essentially created out of thin air, uh, with a few keyboard strokes, decided by a group of you know a half a do dozen to hundred people at the most. Um, and I think that 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 has at least raised awareness. And again, that's one step along that curve to you know adopting hard money. Um, you know, we each individually must have our own personal awareness and understand what it means to have uh, what fiat money means and what it means to have hard money. Um, and I think once you, sh you show people that, you know, this is not a foreign concept, deflation is not scary, you go back and look at the gold standard and you show people that if you earned $100 in the gold during the era of the gold standard, 10 years later, that $100 may actually be worth $120. Or you know, or one hundred and fifty dollars, even, even more, um, that your savings will actually grow. Uh, it will not be sapped by inflation, not be sapped away uh, by the uh, by the state. So I think that th there's there is a whole education process, um, and you know, with technology today, with social media, I think we have greater opportunities to to present the argument that Bitcoin as deflationary money, you know, as a, a is a much better way to operate our economies. It's much, uh, I don't want to use the word fair. I want to say that it creates, basically it creates, it allows everyone to participate yeah. in the economy, economy relatively fairly. There'll always be uneven distribution of money. There'll be people who, who are wealthy mm -hmm. and there'll be people who are not. Yeah, 
but it creates equal opportunities and it reduces the uh, drastically, you know, the, the time preference, which, you know, I was going to connect that to, you know, to the time preference and, and people, I think for the first time would have again, because the thing is, I always say, you know, even our parents and grandparents don't even know, you know, what it was like to be on a goal, uh, on a hard money, like a gold standard. So I think uh, going into this new realm or, or new civilization, uh, monetary civilization with uh, or monetary standards, stand, uh, such as, you know, with Bitcoin, it, it really, I think people can, for the first time, stand still um, and and develop and innovate and and you know start thinking uh, for the future and and uh, and into the future. Uh, so, I think it's going to be a total game changer um, uh, once this critical adopt. You know, what I was going to say also, um, Obi Wan, is that. Um, since the economies are breaking down, unemployment, you know, people need to make money and, 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 and save their livelihood. Do you think that more and more smaller businesses would, would start um, adopting as a parallel, uh, you know, transactional medium, Bitcoin, uh, because they have no other choice uh, then, you know, but, and I, you know, the technology is already there. Would it be, uh, you know, lightning and strike, maybe not on a scale we, we, we would want to, but it is there if we want to use it. Yeah, it is there. Um, I, I think that right now uh, in this early phase of this crisis, most businesses are just struggling with sorting out their, their employees, um, you know, how to pay their bills and whatnot. But I think that as we come out of the, um, the crisis, we may, we may see some some, I think, probably uh, sophisticated businesses, and they may be small businesses, sophisticated small businesses, looking at alternative ways to um, essentially make money. Um, and I think Bitcoin can definitely be part of that. But I think this speaks kind of part back to what you were saying earlier, that we, we still don't have really the, the, the user-friendly devices, the user-friendly apps um, to make you know, any small business person pick up you know, his or her iPhone, uh, iPhone, look at a tablet and, and do a transaction. I, I think we're still, a f uh, we're still a, a few years away from that. But I mean, I have hope. I think light, the Lightning Network is definitely very, very uh, uh, promising. Um, and I think that with some more development in the app space, where it becomes so user-friendly that it's, you really don't even think about it. I mean, it's really got to get to that point mm -hmm. to have mass adoption. Um, I think uh, uh, on Twitter, Beauty On always mentions that that it's got to be you know you can't think about it. You can't think about Bitcoin when you're using Bitcoin. <laughs> you know he he's always uh, he, he, and uh, he's he's absolutely right. I think that there there are multiple layers to Bitcoin ownership. There there are folks like you, uh, myself, and others in, in Bitcoin Twitter that understand the idea of self sovereignty and will run a node. You know we'll, we'll check check the uh, uh, check our balances. We'll verify the the supply. You know, but then there's going to be many, many more above above that level um, who won't, and and they just want it to work. And I think right. that we still have some time before it gets to that point. Yeah, the thing is, um, I mean, the thing is, yeah, I mean, we we do say that um, we are we pretty much agree that it takes time. It just you know everything that we are watching right now unfolding with you know with. Government and you know clamping down on uh, on on you know basic let's just call it basic human rights uh, censorship surveillance so sur Aurelian surveillance state um, at a at a rate of speed that is just uh, unfathomable. I mean, uh, probably this is this is must be subtly very subtly must must have been felt you know uh, like in the early uh, you know nineteen thirties you know uh, pre whatever, or, you know, during the Nazi regime. So uh, sometimes I'm just concerned that uh, can we, you know, can we catch up? I mean, is it, or are we, are we still a little bit too slow with the, with the development, with the adoption rate? Um, or is it going to be, you know, like taken over because of the, you know, the overall structural um, um, the problems we have right now? You know, would it be censorship, surveillance, uh, uh, governments? Um... I think that, yeah, I think that your 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 concerns are are appropriate there. 
the state is definitely expanding its surveillance um, into every type of activity, whether it be you know personal, social, economic activity, and and Bitcoin fun, f falls under that purveyance. Um, I, I think the the biggest concern now at this point, as you said, is that you know the temporary measures that the governments are applying around the world, the U.S. particularly right now, then I'm sure other countries will follow suit. These temporary measures are very hard to reverse. They, they generally become permanent. Um, and so my concern is, is as yours, that uh, the crisis is giving the state an opportunity to uh, apply, to create more, uh, deeper surveillance, uh, more social and social economic engineering. And, um, uh, and, you know, and how does Bitcoin respond to that? And I think that Bitcoin responds by, you know, it just continues you know, block after block, um, you know, the blocks get discovered, you know, every 10 minutes or so. And that's that. And that's what Bitcoin does. And then, you know, we as individuals, you know, interact with the Bitcoin network and we make our own individual decisions on how we're going to uh, um, uh, invest in that network. You know, we, we convert our fiat to Bitcoins and we store our Bitcoins. And, you know, some folks like yourself, you have a podcast, you're educating your listeners, educating others. And, you know, others are um, in the background coding. And so I think that work is still going on and, and that work is growing. I mean, since I've joined Bitcoin Twitter, uh, it's, you know, even though some say it's a ghost town compared to what it was during the 2017 run up, I actually think it's the opposite. I think that the discussion and, and the level of sophistication has gone up exponentially yeah. in the last two years. I mean, I think the discussions here are absolutely fantastic. Um, and, and so I think that we've made huge progress and people are listening. Right. Right. Totally agree with you. Um, why, why Bitcoin? Would you say like, just to wrap this up a little bit, um, why, why Bitcoin? If, if there's a noob out there, why, what would you say to him? What is, uh, um, what is like the vision for, for you personally? Like what, what do you see with Bitcoin? Well, I think why Bitcoin, um, it's sort of like why electricity, you know, once electricity was discovered, that was it. You can't rediscover it. You can't undiscover it. You can't, you know, discover it in a different way. Um, everything else is, is, uh, derivative of that. So Bitcoin was, um, and I think I've posted this a few times on Twitter. Uh, Bitcoin is like early electricity, very raw and dangerous and, and you know, seems unsafe to use. But, you know, in time, you know, it'll power huge, vast industries. Um, and I think it'll power an economic system that is relatively fair to all. And it really defunds the state and, and makes governments significantly smaller than where they are, um, eliminates the concept of welfare state and reduces the, the chances of war. Um, so Bitcoin itself, I think, um, gives us a lot of these opportunities and, and the fact that it is not centrally controlled, the fact that the founder um, is no longer um, around anymore, he's moved on to other projects, uh, uh, just speaks volumes to, to the, the public nature of this, of this, uh, this software. Um, it's easily audited, um, download it, look at it yourself, modify it for fun. Um, and, and I think that's what makes Bitcoin wonderful is that it really is the public's money. Um, and I think going forward um, for, for folks that are looking at Bitcoin, and I think that those are the things that they should be looking at is, you know, what's the, how long has it been around? We've had 10 plus years, the network effects are growing. Um, it's already pushing aside other digital currencies, other cryptocurrencies are being pushed aside. So uh, I think for, for folks new to, new to the space, um, I just point them to Bitcoin and I ask them to please ignore everything else. Exactly. Um, let me just ask you, because this is always a fascinating uh, thing, which is sort of like a pink elephant in the room, is the, you know, this, the purpose of Bitcoin is my, you know, I think we all agree that it's about separation money from state or, you know, should add, you know, stay with it be nation state governments and of especially central banks. Um, because I always question, you know, where does where do these entities, these super centralized entities, which are, you know, always say politically untouchable and legally unaccountable, and um, 
and and criminally immune uh, where do they derive their legitimacy and i think it's time for people to think about that um with everything with all the damages and consequential damages they are uh, you know, the pain and suffering that it's caused, um, uh, at least in the last hundred years, if not even longer. Uh, do, do you, would you agree that this is like the core, the core purpose of, of Bitcoin to finally free us from these centralized, uh, um, and untouchable entities or, uh, structures? Oh, I, I, I think so. I, I agree with you. Um, I think that, you know, what, what Bitcoin offers is uh, not just, you know, a new monetary system, but really a new economic paradigm. It really is going to transform how we uh, are governed or how we govern. And um, uh, it would no longer be this huge monolith um, sending down orders. I think we're going to have uh, much smaller governments. Um, I think we're going to have a banking system that is really harkens back to the original concept of banking, which is storing mm -hmm. depositors funds. Um, I think we're going to have a huge transformation um, in, in, um, uh, in, in humanity and society, but that's not to say, you know, humans, you know, are all going to act uh, um, uh, out of charity and, um, and we'll all be good to each other. I mean, humans are people are people and, and things are going to happen. But I think that, you know, from a, for, at the state level, um, I don't see, you know, in, in hyper Bitcoinization, I don't see the state being empowered as it is now. Mm -hmm. And I think more importantly, um, I don't see the state being self empowered. Uh, there's an article that I'm, a new medium article I'm working on right now. And in it, I, I sort of uh, describe how um, the state itself, through fiat, essentially creates money and funds itself. And it does it very privately, as you said, it does it in secret without any oversight. Whereas Bitcoin, that's Im almost impossible. With Bitcoin, it's very public. You know, if you want to mine Bitcoin, you're adding to the hash rate, you're going to see it. If a government entity wishes to attempt to overthrow Bitcoin, it's going to be a very public affair. And transparent, and, you know, fully and, transparent and, in, in contrast to the non-auditable Fed or whatever, any other central bank or bank for international settlements. It's totally, I mean, like a secretive organization right. that is totally untouchable. This is what really intrigues me. Um, uh, yeah. And 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 if, if a government wants more Bitcoins to fight war, it starts, it starts adding to the network, hash rate goes up, Bitcoin's price goes up. <laughs> And every and everybody in some way, you know, in a, in a oblique and a, a strange way, benefits from that. Yeah. Um, and then the cost of war goes up because the next Bitcoin you need to mine, or the next you know tenth of a Bitcoin you need to mine, is even more expensive. Um, so the cost of war becomes exponentially um, higher with each Bitcoin or fraction of Bitcoin that you, that the government needs to mine in the future. Um, so I think I think that's you know it's a, a fascinating to think about that. You know, what, how will governments act in the future when you know, you, you, you're using Bitcoin as your currency. And I, I think you're going to see a lot of these institutions we rely on or, or have allowed ourselves to rely on will become very uh, muted uh, um, and, and very weakened. Oh, excellent. Well, Obi-Wan, I really enjoyed our talk. Do, we, do, do you have like your final thoughts or, 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 you know, words of wisdom maybe for, for uh, I mean, it's all, all wisdom that you, that you talk, we, we talked about, but um, is there anything like you would really want to like tell people this is, you know, uh, what, what's the process from here now? I think the, the key process is patience. Okay. Um, I think that, <laughs> You know, our, our, we want things to happen right away, but we must understand that they are going to take time. Um, you know, the, this may be a multi-decade uh, journey. This could take 10 years. This could take 20 years, 30 years. But it could also, as, as Parker Lewis says, gradually and suddenly within yeah. a decade and a half, two decades, you know, things have changed. <laughs> Maybe the rallying cry with his own words to quote him yeah. will become strong enough. And people, yeah. I think I, I, I just, I'm just observing this There's a lot of, you know, friends and uh, family of my girlfriend. It's, you know, I, I just, I all turned them into Bitcoiners now, you know, hardcore Bitcoiners. And yeah, this fantastic. really makes me happy. You know, it's, it's like, okay, I'm having, you know, at least uh, I'm, I'm, 
um, some, somehow contributing to, to the comprehension process and why it's really essential, you know, that we go into a human action, as the Austrian economists call it, right? Right. Yeah, and I think the individual, individual action, you know, each person, like you said, uh, you know, you're teaching your, your, your circle, uh, I'm teaching mine, we're both reaching out through um, other media, and I think it's it's a one to one type of interaction where you teach one or two, and then they go on and teach one or two, and uh, that's that's the key process. It's a ground it's a ground up type of uh, um, uh, movement. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> Well, Olivan, I really love your article, your content, and everything you put out. I'm really looking forward to you know to your next article, and hope to have you back. So maybe even on a, on a you know in the framework of a panel discussion, if you're interested. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge. Absolutely, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Stay healthy. Bye bye. Well, I really enjoyed this talk. I mean, uh, Obi-Wan is amazing with his in-depth knowledge and, and wisdom. And, you know, he, he really, um, he's one of the few uh, who, who, in my opinion, you know, uh, is able to connect the dots in a way that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, it's all about holistic, you know, knowledge gathering and connecting the dots. So um, really, uh, really appreciate his, you know, his time get, and, and, and sharing his knowledge and wisdom. Let me know what you think. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, uh, send me an email to hello at the to totalconnector.com and uh, follow, follow me and Obi-Wan on Twitter, on any other social media, on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, uh, but especially on Twitter. And uh, if you are a, a Bitcoin a podcast sponsor, please get in touch with me. My email address again is hello at the totalconnector.com. And uh, would really love to do this more often, especially panel discussions with uh, diverse, you know, uh, multi spectrum thinking uh, Bitcoiners, economists, technologists, experts, scientists, what have you. And yeah, thank you so much for listening, for your support, and um, like it, retweet it, please share it, follow me on Twitter, YouTube, social media, whatever, would really help me distribute uh, my knowledge everywhere to all the noobs or, uh, you know, people who really want to, who are opening up to this, uh, to this really beautiful monetary revolution, which is Bitcoin, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history. My name is Kevin Devani and I'm the Total Connector. Thank you. Mm -hmm.